The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, How Soviet Tanks Learned to Swim. Tactical Briefing, Winged Lion's Breadcrumbs. And Metal Beasts, the Israeli Messerschmitt. We've introduced the top Israeli fighter already, so let's take a look at their earlier ranks. Please welcome the S-199, the plane that the Israeli air tech tree starts with. Its shapes make it easy to tell what plane it was built after, the German Gustav. So let's take a closer look, shall we? The main difference here is the 12-cylinder piston engine, the Junkers Jumo, the fuel tanks are found behind the cockpit. Its fixed armament includes a couple of large caliber machine guns above the engine, as well as two smaller caliber MGs or 20 mm auto cannons in the wings. 50 or 70 kilogram bombs can be loaded under the belly. The new engine happens to be the Israeli Messerschmitt's main flaw. Its power is almost a quarter lower than the standard DB605, only 1,320 horsepower. That difference had such an impact on the aircraft's flight performance that this Gustav can't even be called a Friedrich now. However, it's unfair to judge this fighter in such a way. You see, its battle rating is only 3.3. At that level, its top speed and climb rate are good enough. And you could simply avoid dogfights but there's another catch. Along with the Daimler-Benz engine, the S-199 lost a gun that was installed there. You can really feel the loss at the beginning of your upgrade process when your firepower is limited to four machine guns. It's still enough to punch your enemies, but you'll have to tail each plane for quite long periods before finally getting it down. Fortunately, this state of affairs will change to the opposite when you get two 20mm MG-151 cannons. They bring enough firepower with them to make boom and zoom and frontal attacks possible so that you won't have to lose any more speed that the Messerschmitt fighters are so keen on. Another thing you need to keep in mind is the overheating issue. It's pretty easy to fix, though. Just reduce your thrust for a couple of seconds when you don't need it. Alternatively, you can open up the radiators. They increase air drag, of course, but it's better than having a boiling engine mid-battle. Now, in mixed battles, the S-199 shows a surprisingly good performance. With bombs being placed along the central line of the aircraft and the ability to drop them individually, you can destroy up to four enemy tanks with a single load. And you'll still have a fully capable fighter afterwards, capable of chasing enemy attackers or bombers. Besides enemy air, artillery, infantry and other armor, the tanks have always been threatened by water. How do you quickly put a group of tanks across a river? Even if there's a bridge nearby, you can never be sure it will hold the mass of a tank. So what do you do? Stop and wait for the pontoons? That's too long. And waiting on a riverbank isn't the safest option. So you need an alternative way of crossing water obstacles. So each tank-building school developed their own ways of solving that issue. The Germans, for instance, came up with deep wading. The Tigers and the Panthers were the first tanks to have their cooling systems waterproof. Before crossing a river, the crew would seal the hatches, extend the air intake pipe, and turn off the fans. The water would get to the place where the fans were and cool down the engine while going across a riverbed. The Panzer models 3 and 4 had deep wading variations too, 
They were called the Tauchpanzers, which is German for diving tanks. The Soviet Union only started their own experiments on this after the war. Originally, their army put their money on floating tanks. And while other nations limited their effort to prototype or test batches, the Soviet Union began a full-scale mass production. The engineers' experiments were safe and, well, but the onset of war and a severe shortage of any kind of armor changed the whole course of the matter. First, the amphibious T-40 tank lost its water propeller to simplify the design. But then it was completely forgotten since the army made the switch to the light T-60 and T-70 tanks lacking the amphibious capability. They only came back to the idea after the war was over. And when they did, the military wanted a fully capable 14-ton tank with a 76mm gun and a high level of mobility. In response to that, the engineers came up with the PT-76 project, a true breakthrough for its time. This amphibian tank received a gun powerful enough to damage enemy armor, even if with some reservations. The six-cylinder diesel provided enough speed and its off-road capabilities even exceeded the military requirements. Instead of water propellers, the tank was the first to receive water jets protected by armor sheets. And of course, the PT-76's main advantage was being fully amphibian. The tank was even tested at sea and showed that it could even shoot while swimming. They also showed a good performance in reconnaissance and airborne missions. The PT-76 would go through lengthy relocations with no major issues and cross rivers without getting stuck in boggier places. Their appearance raised a wave even across the ocean. Once the American army caught news of the PT-76, they cancelled the almost ready project of the T-92 and commissioned an amphibian tank of their own that would go on to receive the name of Sheridan. And while the Soviet Union later dropped the idea of developing more amphibian tanks, instead switching to armored personnel carriers, the PT-76 still serves with the armies of multiple world nations despite the age. It looks like it's not even going to come ashore anytime soon. We have this little tradition where we give you a summary of all the smaller changes brought in by a major update that might have been lost among the bigger ones. So let's take a look at what the winged lions introduced. We'll start with the effects this time. You probably noticed already winds started blowing in War Thunder last December. Smoke, flames, gunshots, explosions, sparks, road dust, and engine fumes. All of these are now carried away by the wind right in front of your eyes. Moreover, we've reworked the collision marks on armor. Now you can admire your own and your enemy's battle scars in a higher quality. The new sound effects, such as gunshots, air and ground engine hums now have improved surrounding support. The tankers can now even hear their own suspension working, responding to each pull on the controls while driving cross-country. And here's the nicest music to your ears. New unique sounds for each jet's engine sound. The editors didn't even give me any text and asked to stay silent for a while to give you some time to listen to these turbines. Meanwhile, we're still working on some older vehicles, polishing them into the new War Thunder quality standards. The Winged Lions update gave a dozen tanks volumetric armor allowing for a more precise modeling of shell hits. More than 30 machines received physically correct tracks 
that actually roll on the ground when torn. War Thunder pilots would spot some changes too. The RWR module cannot be found in the upgrades anymore. And the good news is, the radar warning system is now available by default, with no need to grind for it. All the experience or golden eagles you've spent on researching this part has been fully refunded to your accounts. There's another piece of good news for fans of ground attacks. All HVAR and RP-3 rockets have been switched to individual launches, which means you can get twice as many frags on each load. Moreover, some aircraft receive new weaponry choices in their respective arsenals. For instance, the American F-4E can now carry 2,000-pound TV-guided bombs. The German MiG-21 BIS R-60 missiles have been updated to the MK modification, the one with an all-aspect homing device. Finally, the Navy battle fans will note that the shell's ballistics have been reworked. We've changed the speed loss dynamics according to historical data and changed the impact of air drag, which affected the shell's flight time. The trajectories are now flatter, there's less speed lost over distance, and many rounds have increased penetration rates. And we aren't planning on stopping there. We're still testing new features and improving the game after each update. Please, tell us what changes you like the best. Meanwhile, we're going to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Wim. So what was the actual problem with a single spar wing on the 110 slash 410? Hi Wim. The single spar wing is simpler and lighter, but its structure has a much lower resistance to bending, rolling, and especially twisting loads. Fixing these issues in a single spar construction will always bring a snowballing increase of mass. That's why such a wing is good for lightweight, slow aircraft, where the priority is low costs, simple repairs, and maintenance. Faster machines, however, need a multiple spar wing. It's heavier and harder to make, but shows a much better performance. Elliptical asks, how do you operate the top-mounted machine gun without rotating the turret? Are there elliptical? You can switch to it using the multifunctional menu. To do that, press Weaponry, then select Machine Gun. Another question comes from Michael McCullough. What makes the A7E better than the A7D? Hello, Michael. It's all about the guided bombs and the thermal vision pod. Kakakiri writes, Why not PT-57 instead... PT-7657. Hi there. It might have to do with the fact that the machine was based on the PT-76, not built from scratch. Although we admit we like the PT-56 more since it's shorter and more straightforward. And the last comment for today was written by Emile Fauri Lamprecht. Which tank should research? German M48A2C? or Leopard 1. Hello, Emil. The armor on the M48 can sometimes save you from armor-piercing shells, but you will have to constantly switch between APC-BC and HEAT-FS rounds depending on the situation. The Leopard only has one main round, and it's a bit faster, but the protection leaves much to be desired. Choose the one that fits your playing style more. Well, again, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4pm GMT 
or noon Eastern time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. And I have missed a couple and I'm very upset. Don't forget to check if your tank can float before jumping into a river. Hmm, <laughs> some did. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.